It took about a twentieth of a second for the bullet to get from the barrel of that gun to the target. That's pretty fast. But in that same twentieth of a second, this 8386 microprocessor from Intel can perform 200,000 calculations. That's pretty fast, too. Today, we're going to take a look at the whole new generation of 386-based machines computing in the fast lane on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee. Gary Kildall is off working. George Morrow's away. So with me today is Jan Lewis, who is also president of the Palo Alto Research Group. Jan, this is what the fuss is all about, the 8386 microprocessor from Intel. Now, no real operating system, no real software yet, yet people are waiting in line to buy computers with a 386 in it. More talk about it than probably anything since the IBM PC came out. Is this a lot of hype, or is this really a major development of personal computers? Oh, this is not just hype, Stuart. This is a quantum leap in personal computers. Right now, people are standing in line to get these systems just for the raw speed that it offers. Graphics applications, telecommunications, CAD CAM require a lot of speed. But the real promise of this chip are in the applications that will be coming down the road mm -hmm. in the next, let's say, two to five years, a whole new breed of software and applications. Jan, we're going to take a look at the new Compact Desk Pro 386. We'll also look at the new Zenith Z386. We'll talk to the people from Intel about the chip, and we'll talk to a software developer about future applications on 386 computers. First of all, we are going to get Gary into the act. We're going to go visit Gary Kildall's workshop in Monterey, California for a preview look at what a 386 computer can really do. Very few hardware introductions have received as much attention as Intel's new 386 microprocessor. The fast 32-bit chip is already available in a number of desktop machines at prices that definitely put it into the microcomputer category. The Knowledge Set Corporation in Monterey, California, recently purchased a 386 Micro to assist their CD-ROM software developers. So far, the machine runs compilation tests about three times faster than the AT and equally shines in calculation-intensive graphics displays. The uh, 386 machine that we're using here uh, is important in, in a development environment because it lets us get through our programming tasks a lot faster than we, uh, that we were able to do before. In fact, uh, where we would, would have used a VAX maybe for a, a program development, we um, now are, are using the 386 uh, much more to do the, for each engineer. And it's a, uh, we don't have to have the halon fire extinguisher systems or the computer room that's got the air conditioning in it and things of that sort. Very expensive operation to run a bigger machine. Closing the gap between minis and micros is certain to affect prices and likely to give a boost to the development of new applications. The, the reason that we're going to see uh, new applications is not so much because of that of the, of the 386, but the fact that it's it's now readily accessible to a large number of people. It's, now you could, you could consider building, say, an expert system that you could sell. In spite of all the publicity, 32-bit chips are not new technology. But developers see special promise in this new round of introductions. The interesting thing is that the 386 has grown out of the IBM PC world, and it's not just the 386 that's important here. It's, it's the idea that it's now accepted in our society, in, our, in a computer-consuming uh, society, as being the next stage to move to. Well, that means that, that as we move into a machine like this, that the, the basic underlying functionality has got to be improved considerably.
Joining us now in the studio is Michael Swavely. Michael's the Vice President of Marketing for Compaq Computers, makers of the Compaq Desk Pro 386. Also with us from Compaq is Lynn Parsons, who's going to be operating the 386 during our demonstration. Jan? Mike, these machines have been selling like hotcakes. Who is buying them and what are they using them for? Well, Jan, they have been selling well and a whole range of customers are finding that they meet their needs. Uh, most of these customers are really looking for the power and performance that the 386 brings to their applications, whether they're very large spreadsheets, very large databases, or more specialized applications such as CAD CAE, uh, network file servers, or even a small multi-user system running Xenex. So I guess it's really the speed, as Jan mentioned at the beginning of the show, that the users are looking for now. I, I want to try to give our audience a, a feel okay. for the speed of this machine. You've got a very complex macro up here, which you're going to run on a spreadsheet. Tell us about the demo. Right. This is uh, about a 5,000 cell spreadsheet, and this is a very complicated macro running under Lotus 1, 2, 3. And, um, okay, let's just go. sort of run this macro now, Lynn, and we'll see how long it takes. Okay, well, as you could tell, it was a very complex macro, even for one, two, three, right. and uh, fills in the spreadsheet, does some recalculations, then goes back and uh, does some comparisons, and then refills the spreadsheet, a couple other items like that, and uh, takes a grand total of all of about 16 seconds to complete this very complex uh, spreadsheet. And there it is. And there it and is. And we saw it went out to about 500 rows there, didn't right. it? Right. Over 5,000 cells yeah. uh, are worked with in this uh, particular example. Okay. To really get a sense of the comparative speed here, Lynn, I'm going to ask you, you can set up the compact to run in the 8088 mode at 4.77 right. megahertz. So if Lynn, you'll do that and run that same macro on the same spreadsheet, we'll run a clock on it and see what the difference is. Okay. You know, this brings up an interesting question, though. Does the speed of the 386, does this obsolete the AT and the 286? No, I don't think it obsoletes it. Um, there will still be a significant price difference for the added performance of the 386. And uh, I think that both the 286-based products as well as the 386-based products will have a place in the marketplace for the next several years. Okay, excuse me. You've just started running the, the demo now in the, in the slower mode. So mm -hmm. we'll run a clock on this and we'll see how long it takes. Okay. Uh, Mike, what about this issue of compatibility? I mean, how nervous should a user be? Uh, we see here an example of compatibility in which you're right. able to put it into that uh, 8088 mode. Uh, all existing software will run on this? Yes, basically Compact is staking its reputation that is built for delivering the utmost in compatibility on this product, uh, as we do with every new product we introduce, and uh, the user should feel very comfortable with the compatibility of the product. Now, s some users are worried about what IBM will do, and any day IBM will announce its 386 machine, right. and everybody's saying, what a gutsy move on the part of Compact to be out there first. Mm -hmm. How afraid is the company of this? How risky a move is it really? We don't feel like it's a risky move at all. Uh, we believe that the industry standard that has been established for uh, software for the business marketplace is clearly in place. And what we've done here with the Desk Pro 386 is innovate within that existing standard, as opposed to trying to go outside the standard and do something different. Now, IBM uh, may or may not enter the marketplace at any point in the future. Uh, the market will judge what IBM brings to the market in the same way as it judges uh, any other manufacturers, um, new products. And you're not worried about their getting out there on a standard which is slightly different from yours and having to battle that? Not particularly, because they do have to live within the market realities. And the reality is that American business has made an enormous investment in the industry standard. Mm -hmm. And for IBM or anyone else. They may have buried themselves in this standard here. <laughs> this this thing great. is still running, by the way, Jan. You know, we're still watching uh, the slower version, <laughs> NXT, if you will, right. trying to still do those recalculations. This still says, wait, wait, wait. Uh, while we're waiting, Mike, uh, one other question. When do you see people are saying, well, where is the real application? Where is the real power? Jan was talking about mm -hmm. the graphics. All the new things we'll be able to do. When is that going to happen? Well, I think that the introduction of the Desk Pro 386 has kicked off the start of that. And frankly, there's hundreds of companies out in the industry right now working on new hardware capabilities, new software capabilities to really deliver all the benefits of the 3D6 architecture to the customer. So I think we'll start seeing those. Ah. What do you know? It done it. It did it. <laughs> and on my watch, it took two minutes and 17 seconds for it to do what took 16 seconds right. when you were running it with the 386 chip. Yeah, about eight and a half times yeah. uh, longer. Pretty impressive. Thank you very much. Now, as Mike said, some software companies already are working on applications for the 386. One of the first out of the gate is Sun Microsystems, and Wendy Woods has a report on that.
you're looking at several programs running at once on a 386-based PC. The windows are the manifestation of a programming tool called News from Sun Microsystems. Previously, this product was only available for use on Sun workstations. Pardon the pun, but why is this news? Because Sun is betting that the 386 will become as pervasive as the chip that runs today's PC. By getting in there first with a windowing product that can be adapted to many machines, Sun hopes to make news the new windowing standard. If you look at uh, both in uh, CAD CAM, publishing, uh, those sorts of markets, 386 is going to be a player. Uh, news is going to be, we believe, a component in every one of those. Um, in addition, customers who have Suns would be able to use the same applications on both Suns and on the 386's running news. And that's again why it's attractive to license news to the 386 community. News is also unique in that it is partially constructed with PostScript, a sophisticated imaging model which enables a user to manipulate the size and scale of each window. Will Sun's news on the 386 be as successful as the company hopes? Well, only time will tell. But the fact is, there are a good two dozen software companies, many of them big names, already using news to write their applications for the 386. And that tells you something about their level of confidence. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. With us now in the studio is Bob Dilworth, the president of Zenith Data Systems, makers of the new Zenith Z386 computer. Also with us in the studio is Holden Aust from Zenith, who's going to be operating the 386 for us. Jan? Bob, how is your machine different from the Compact Desk Pro 386 that we just saw? Uh, they're very similar. There are some features. We both uh, basically had to design uh, without knowing what you, each other was doing, and, and obviously both companies are interested in, in trying to protect uh, standards where we can. But uh, the, we're, we're unique in the way we handle memory. We uh, have some uh, uh, advantages in cache memory, things like that, that make it a little bit different. But they're both very fast uh, MS-DOS machines. Is really what the is, is, is the machine out now? Is this a, a product at this point? It is a product. It is out. And uh, we're shipping primarily uh, early samples to, uh, to some of our existing customers. Who are buying these machines now, and what are they using them for? And generally speaking, it's people that need the speed uh, or need uh, lots of memory access or speed in handling uh, large database uh, files. Is there a real market uh, for the 386 machine just based on speed and memory, or is it going to really depend on the new, more sophisticated applications for this kind of machine to really move? Obviously, the new applications and some new applications will drive the market, but uh, already we see sophisticated software packages that are sluggish even on a 286 product. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they need that 386 to really get, to make the, the packages snap. And it's like any uh, computer system, uh, we can be doing uh, days worth of work in seconds and you want it to come quicker and okay, faster. Okay, let's try to show some snap here. And Holden, we're gonna ask you to run this. We have now, I guess, what's in here? A 10-page document in WordStar? That's right. Not known as a fast uh, mover necessarily, right? And, and what are we gonna do? What are you gonna demonstrate? Uh, I believe we're going to correct uh, a document. We've made some errors somewhere, so that okay. you're going to go through and... Yeah, you've got, you mistyped the word memory, M-E-M-O-R-I, and you forgot the period and the space in that right. sentence. Okay, now I happen to know, since we prepared this here for you, <laughs> that that error occurs 90 times in That's this right. document. So I want you to do a search and replace and correct that. Let's see how long it takes uh, to correct that. Go ahead, Holden. Whipping right along. Mm, that's fast. And I guess if you're a usual WordStar user, and if you run that on a, on a slower machine, you know, it takes yeah, a lot it's a, longer it's a, it's a, it's a timely process. Uh, to do 90 uh, search and replaces there than that. And you notice it's shifting the line at the same time as it goes through these 90 occurrences. That's right, because what you, the correction is longer than the original word. That's right. And I guess we see where, uh, I guess it tells you what page you're on. We're almost about finished, finished that document there. A any sense of comparison in speed, uh, Bob, as to how much faster this is than uh, if you're doing this uh, on a... Three to four times faster than on a 286, and, and of course, much faster yeah. on, a, on an 8080. Part. Holden, I want to ask you to do one more thing to try to show the speed here. I see the word zenith is the last word in the document, and it occurs nowhere else in the document. Let's see how long it would take if we wanted to do a search and replace on the word zenith. Uh, so in other words, see how long it takes to go through those 10 pages. And I, I think 
We better tell the audience to watch very carefully. Because <laughs> right? I've seen this done before. Don't blink. And go? Go. Did it. <laughs> okay, faster than the eye can see. Bob, uh, what about IBM? Everybody's talking about waiting for IBM. What will IBM's move be? What do you think is going to happen there? Uh, sure. I think, uh, in fact, uh, you know, we read the press and read all the same documents everybody else uh, reads and really don't have any advantage. Uh, we expect that they will eventually use the chip in, in some fashion. Uh, really don't know when and how fast. Uh, and we'll just all have to wait and see. What do you think the consequences are going to be to users when these new kinds of applications come along? I mean, how will the availability of 3D6, Jen described this as a quantum leap in personal computing, what's that going to mean to the, to the businessman, to the corporate user and so on in terms of what you can do really that you can't do now other than do it faster? You know, I think that uh, the next step in many of the software packages, and you need to sort of stop and, and, and people buy... Uh, applications that are then backed up by software, which is f finally uh, needs hardware to, to uh, run the application. So we really don't drive the market with a piece of hardware. What really drives the market is the software. And in this particular case, uh, I think we're going to see software packages where to make them easy to use, you know, the artificial intelligence type of, yeah. of, of products, are going to need this kind of power and speed in order to make them an acceptable application. Bob Holden, thank you very much for joining us. Now, in just a minute, we're going to talk to guests from Intel and Phoenix Technologies and talk about the future of the 386. Stay with us. Joining us now in the studio is Neil Colvin, Chairman and CEO of Phoenix Technologies. And sitting next to Neil is Dana Crelly, Marketing Manager for the 8386 at Intel. Dana, the 386 is being hailed as a major breakthrough in personal computing. Can you give us some background on the 386 and why all the fuss? Well, certainly. Um, first of all, the 386 is the 32-bit generation of the 86, gen 86 architecture and technology, which the 8088 generation of PCs is based on. And after that, the 286 generation of PCs is based on our 286. The 386 is a 32-bit member of the family and offers not only compatibility with those previous generations of machines, as well as a performance increment over what those machines are able to do, but offers a much richer architecture from which the software developers will be able to uh, make a lot more things available to end users. Dana, we know the, the hardware usually leads the software here, and of course that's one of the issues we talk about in utilizing the 386. Now, uh, what about the operating system specifically? What's going to happen there with the 386 to take advantage of it? Well, first of all, the uh, Unix technology is based is already well underway for the 386. The uh, Unix System 5 Release 3 port to the 386 is in beta site today at over 50 different OEMs who are developing products based on Unix and the 386. And certification from AT&T should happen in the early first quarter next year. Additionally, several OEMs are developing products that surround um, the 386 and Unix with various features, as well as ISVs, one of which we'll see today uh, with Neil um, and running uh, DOS on top of Unix. There are several companies doing that, including Locus, as well as Phoenix and Interactive. And additionally, there's windowing technologies being put onto 386 Unix uh, from Sun Microsystems, as well as others. So for the Unix marketplace, the mini computer and workstation marketplace, the software environment for the 386 is already very well developed and uh, about ready to come to market in a lot of machines. Okay, you, you've led us into Neil now, so let, let's talk about your product, which is called VPix, I believe. And what does it do? Well, VPix is an integration of the Unix environment for the 386 and the PC-DOS PC environment that we are all so familiar with. It allows you to run any PC task under Unix as a Unix task. And what is the advantage then of doing that on the 386? It gives you an ability to have the best of both worlds. You can run your Unix jobs, which are typically CAD CAM, high-level engineering, things like that. And then at the same time, switch immediately to running some of the more popular DOS-type applications such as Lotus or Ashton Tate's DBase okay, or something Okay, could you give sort. us a demonstration of VPix and, and describe the setup you have here, Neil? Okay. What we have here is we have a serial terminal and a regular e IBM EGA-type terminal. Okay. And the serial terminal is hooked over an RS-232 link to the processor. And You're playing two people here. I'm playing two, two people. Keyboards. This is a okay. two-user Unix system. So that in fact, we are running two separate Unix tasks at the same time. For instance, if I type a standard Unix 
command down here, we see we're running a Unix system with a Unix type file structure. Okay. Now what I'll do is on the EGA, I'll start up our virtual PC. If I can type. Okay. Now this is just as if we were booting a regular PC or PC compatible. We come up with the ROM sign on message, we actually load in a PC DOS, and now mm -hmm. we're up and running in a virtual PC. One of the things that we can do is we can actually nest these types of environments in the sense that we can run another operating environment like Microsoft Windows right on top of this virtual PC. Mm -hmm. And we'll start up Microsoft Windows here. And I'll select an actual Microsoft Windows task. One of them, which just sort of runs all by itself, is their clock, which you can put into a window, and it sits here and counts okay, time so for So we're us. running Microsoft Windows under MS-DOS, and at the same time... At the same time, we're still running Unix on the other terminal. I can do another Unix job over here if I wanted to, another screen display or something uh -huh. like that. Or I can start up another virtual PC on this terminal. Now, this terminal is not a PC screen. It's just a serial terminal. But I can still bring up such applications as Lotus 1, 2, 3 mm -hmm. simultaneously. And there it is. Right. OK, now, and I think you can also show me, in, OK, we've got Lotus over there. We've got Microsoft Windows running over there. Right. I think you can also show me actually how we can see the two different Unix and, and, and MS-DOS directories. Right. One of the very interesting things is, and let's just stop Lotus here very rapidly. is that we are actually using exactly the same file structures for both applications, mm -hmm. both in the case of Unix. Here we have the Unix files. And we'll quickly close down the Windows operation over here. Get back to the standard DOS and environment. As usual here, the machine is a lot faster than the man. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the, the yeah. slowest part of this system. And if I do a standard DOS directory command here, yeah. we're actually looking at exactly the same set of files in both cases. In this case, we're looking at it from the DOS point of view, and here we're looking at it from the Unix point of view. Dana, let me ask you, we've heard a lot about the different modes in running the 3D6, virtual mode and protected mode and so on. Explain that. What does all that mean? Well, first of all, there's really one mode in the, in the processor that everybody is using, and that is the protected mode of the processor. The virtual capabilities, the ability to run a virtual 86 machine on top of uh, a Unix, is all contained within the protected mode. Mm -hmm. So the virtual capability is a subset of the protected mode and is selectable, selectable on a task-by-task -task or user-by-user -user basis within the protected mode. And protected mode means? It means the full architecture of the machine, the full 32-bit virtual memory architecture uh, of the processor. So that means that an application, for instance, could not clobber the operating system? Or that's vice that's one of the, one of the yeah. reasons we call it protected mode is because there are several intrinsic uh, features in the chip that allow protection, first of all, from the, oper the application being able to hurt the operating system, and also from an application to being able to hurt another application. And then further, um, there's also protection from within an application being able to do wrong things to the machine. There's protection on all those different areas within a full 32-bit multitasking environment. Real quick, gentlemen, about 30 seconds. What, what's the future here? What does a 386 machine mean to the user down the line now, once we get the applications going? Well, I think it'll mean that the applications that will become available in the next couple of years will be far more powerful than the applications we have today. Many of them we expect to incorporate a lot of artificial intelligence techniques to allow the machine to be molded to the user now, rather than vice versa in the past. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Jan, thank you for being with us here. We're all out of time. We'll be back in just a minute with this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, it's time for all the IBM prognosticators to be proven right or wrong. Rumors floated for months at the end of 86 that 1987 would see Big Blue come out with a new low-end PC aimed at the education market, a new souped-up 286 machine, and a new 386-based computer. But while everyone waits to see what's new, it appears that IBM has called it quits on the original PC, the computer that revolutionized the personal computer business. Sources say that production of the IBM PC has stopped and that production facilities are being retooled for the new generation of PCs expected this year. Despite the reports that PC production is over, the original IBM PC still accounts for about 7% of all PC sales. 
What will 1987 be the year of? Remember this time last year when all the writers were saying that 1986 would be the year of artificial intelligence? Well, it didn't turn out that way. AI products have generally been a disappointment, and the stock prices of AI companies fell to a three-year low at the end of 86, down an average of 26% from a year ago. One big factor in the future of artificial intelligence applications will be the role of the Defense Department, which up until now has been a major supporter of AI research, especially to support Star Wars or SDI. A recent study by Ryder College in New Jersey concludes that college students who use computers and word processors get better grades on papers than students who use typewriters. The study found that on a four-point scale, papers done on a word processor averaged a 3.1, while papers done on a typewriter averaged only a 2.6. Other interesting results were that in the sample of 200 papers, no student who used a word processor failed a paper, and papers on word processors tended to be longer than typewritten ones. Finally, and this was a surprise, 76% of the papers done on computers were written by women. Lawmakers in Montana have come up with a new idea for an online database that lists all pending bills before the state legislature, the names of sponsors, the schedules for committee hearings, and the status of the bills. Users pay a flat fee of $100 for unlimited access to the system. Time for this week's software review. Here's Paul Schindler. Go away. Don't bother me. Oh, it's you. Well, okay, I'll let you in on a little secret. Any doubts I had about the Atari ST computer were wiped out when I saw Time Bandit, a simply spectacular collection of maze-type games that takes full advantage of the color graphics capability of the Atari. There are 16 separate games included in this single package, each of which can be played at 16 different levels. These people even make selecting what game to play into a game. If you aren't careful during the selection process, you'll be carried off by a spaceship to a game not of your choice. Take a good look at these graphics. They may not show up clearly on your screen, but the torches even flicker. The monsters that chase you in these mazes cover the range from ghosts to something that looks like a tomato. The problem with most games is boredom. With Time Bandits, there's so many choices, it's hard to imagine wearing it out. Hats off to Mitch Tron of Pontiac, Michigan, distributors of this nifty $40 Atari game. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. A California travel writer has come out with what may be the first complete book distributed exclusively on a floppy disk. It's called West Coast Travel California, and it's selling for $19.95. The author, Lee Foster, says it's much more practical than a printed book. Updates and new editions are cheaper, and readers can pull out only those chapters they really want and print them out. And, says Foster, after underlining and scribbling all over the pages, you can always print out a fresh copy from your computer. Finally, a computer researcher at Bell Labs says she has done a computer analysis of Leonardo da Vinci's painting The Mona Lisa and a sketch of the artist himself, and she concludes da Vinci himself was the model for Mona Lisa. She says the computer analysis of the facial structure of da Vinci and Mona Lisa show they are identical. She says stories that the model was a woman named Mona Lisa Gherardini are only based on rumor and hearsay. And further, she says Leonardo da Vinci was probably gay and Mona Lisa was probably a fantasy self-portrait. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible by Leading Edge, makers of IBM-compatible computer systems, including Lotus Lookalike Spreadsheet, word processing with spelling correction, communication software, and Hayes-compatible 1200 baud modem. Leading Edge, with over 1,000 service centers nationwide. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide.